and good morning or good evening to you based on whichever part of the globe that you are in. Dr. Truptesh and myself, we are happy to announce and bring you this session of East Meets West webinar, which we do every three months. And this time, our topic rotates around bariatric surgery, bariatric endobariatrics and bariatrics. So the topic is a stitch in time saves nine, a paradigm shift in endobariatrics. And for this, we have four global speakers, as usual, two from the East and two from the West. So we have Dr. Barham Abudai from the Mayo Clinic. Then we have Dr. Ravi Shankar Ashok Kumar from the Singapore General Hospital, Singapore. Dr. Anna Carolina Hoff from Sao Paulo and Dr. Rakesh Kalapala from the Asian Institute of Gastroenterology in India. And this is the program that we can see over here. So we will have Dr. Param give us an overview and an introduction to bariatric endoscopy and the technique of endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty following which Dr. Ravi Shankar will be speaking about intragastric balloon. Then we'll have Dr. Anna talking about trans outlet reduction endoscopy. And then we'll have Dr. Rakesh speaking about endoscopic management of bariatric surgery complications. Following that, as we always do, we'll have a 30 minute session of live quick question and answers. And I would request all the participants to put in their questions in the Q&A box rather than in the chat box. Any logistic issues regarding logging in or audio or some technical issues, you can post in the chat box, but put your question and answers, uh, your questions in the questions box. And then we'll wrap up hopefully in about 90 minutes or so. So with that, I would like to hand over the podium to Dr. Truptesh. Truptesh. Please take over and let's have a great session here. Thank you, Amol. So welcome uh, to all the renowned uh, faculties and thank you for giving us your time on a Saturday uh, so that we can uh, impart the knowledge that you guys have acquired and the way of your practicing endobariatrics in the East versus West. And uh, not without taking any too much of time, I would uh, like to have Dr. Baram Abudaya to take over the podium and talk about the introduction to endobariatrics and uh, gastric sleeve. Baram. All right, thank you for the kind introduction uh, and thanks for the organizer and the sponsors for putting this webinar together. East meets West, uh, learning uh, from each other is the key concept and that's uh, that we always should welcome this opportunity. So my topic today over the next 20 minutes, I'm gonna give you a glimpse uh, on the world of uh, bariatric and metabolic endoscopy and uh, and uh, hopefully highlight some of the advancements and some of the innovations in this field as well. This is a quote uh, from uh, our founder uh, at the Mayo Clinic or one of the founders, Dr. Charles Mayo. And in this quote, he alluded to the concept of uh, continuing to be on the forefront of innovation and changes in medicine, that today the only thing that is permanent is change. And I think that hopefully will echo in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in my lecture uh, as well, as far as theme of innovation and progress in this field. These are my disclosures for the purpose of this talk. But before we start talking about <clears throat> technology, uh, it's very important to highlight the magnitude of the problem that we're trying to help uh, in solving. And the problem is uh, both the, uh, obesity and diabetes go hand in hand. 
uh, about 60% of the U.S. population is projected to have the disease of obesity by 2030, and, uh, and its metabolic consequences with the hallmark being type 2 diabetes. You could see these are the numbers from CDC, about 37 million Americans with type 2 uh, diabetes. About 100 million have prediabetes, that means they're progressing, and most of them do not know that they even have the disease, and there's significant burden in this cohort as well. When we look at unmet needs, you could see despite advancement in medical management of type 2 diabetes, if you look at percentage of American diabetics uh, who are under optimal control, that means hemoglobin A1C less than seven, you could see that over the past 20 plus years, there's still about 50% of patients with type two diabetes in a modern advanced country who are not under optimal control. And when you, sup you superimpose on that, uh, LDL control or management of hypercholesterolemia, uh, blood pressure control, and cessation of uh, smoking, you could see that the majority of patients with the disease are not meeting these critical targets that have been associated with macro and microvascular complications of the disease. So the unmet need uh, is we need to start leveraging the gut as a treatment strategy for obesity and for its metabolic consequences, because that will likely offer the most promise uh, as far as a disease modifying and a treatment paradigm in the future. And why do I say that? I say that because the gut is central for metabolic regulation. The gut has a robust gut immune system that governs both a that, that regulates both local and systematic uh, inflammation. There are states of gut changes that happen with metabolic disease, like dysbiosis and alteration in the gut microbiome. These cause systematic inflammation. There is gut uh, nervous system that has been described as the second brain, which is fundamental in how the gut regulates its metabolic function. And as we all know, as gastroenterologists, that the gut is critical in digestion and absorption, uh, regulating the absorption of uh, essential nutrients uh, and uh, metabolites that, that uh, are produced as a result of the microbiome. So simplistically stating, the gut is truly central in function and in physiology and regulating metabolism. And how we, do we leverage the gut for treatment of disease is going to be a core treatment paradigm. So the analogy I give to simplify the concept is states of metabolic disease like obesity is a dysfunctioning orchestra. Right now, we target downstream players. So the flute player is not playing well. We adjust the flute player. The violinist get out of sync. We adjust the violinist. And the GI track offer the promise that we now could coordinate the entire orchestra by modifying the conductor rather than the downstream effects of this dysfunctional orchestra. And the, 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 the evidence that highlights the importance of the gut comes from comparing two treatment strategies for type 2 diabetes. In the first strategy, in a randomized trial of about 5,000 diabetics, patients were randomized for optimal glycemic control to build on a base of 2 grams of metformin and intensify therapy by adding either a SGL2 inhibitor, a sulfonylurea, a GLP-1 agonist, or basal insulin, with the primary endpoint is keep achieving optimal glycemic control and maintaining a hemoglobin A1C less than seven. The graph on top shows percentage of patients per year that lost that control or achieved hemoglobin A1C more than seven. And you could see about a third of patients in whatever strategy surpassed the optimal control and got out of control uh, per year. When you look at the cumulative incidence in the graphs below, you could see that regardless of the treatment strategy, Type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease, and, and most of these patients get out of control by the duration of study follow-up. 
that means they are progressing toward insulin. Uh, now, let's compare and contrast another trial that targets the gut uh, for the treatment of type 2 diabetes, and mostly looking at this procedure called Rho and Y gastric bypass that has gastric components to it by causing restriction and have a bypass of the proximal intestine component uh, targeting that metabolic response. Similar tri trial design published in The Lancet, now following patients for 10 years, that compares the impact of altering the gut with bariatric surgery on type 2 diabetes. The graph in red is the, uh, is the medical management of type 2 diabetes. The graphs in blue and green showing the uh, bariatric surgery arm, whether it's a gastric bypass or pancreatic biliary diversion. Compared to the medical strategy, most patients maintain control of their glycemia, uh, of their hyperglycemia at 10 years. And those uh, uh, with, uh, and those on the medical arm, about 50% of them progress to requiring insulin at the 10-year duration versus, versus only 5% in the gastric bypass arm and 0% in the pancreatic biliary diversion. What that tells me is when we target the gut, we achieve better control of diabetes, and we are somehow modifying metabolic disease to resetting its clock rather than managing its symptoms. And that becomes the core principle of why we are bullish and gung-ho about the field of endobariatrics, where we're gonna leverage the same targets in the gut, but in a minimally invasive and scalable fashion to scale the benefits of bariatric surgery. And that's the paradigm that we're trying to push here. We're gonna cross the chiasm between medical and surgical management. We have medications that are getting better but endobariatrics is also getting better and safer, and the future is quite bright along this trajectory. So when we talk about these techniques, it's helpful to divide them into those that work on the stomach and then those that work on the small intestines. Those that work on the stomach predominantly affect human appetite, which is the process of satiety and satiation. That means they, they have you eat less because you're feeling full quicker and for longer by affecting the gastric accommodation and the emptying of the stomach. Those that techniques that work on the small intestines predominantly work on changing the uh, parameter on insulin resistance, bile and fat, fatty acid signaling, incretin and the microbiome, and most importantly, uh, working on gut inflammation, which is crucial in the macro and microvascular complications that comes with diseases of excess adiposity. Uh, the idea, again, is to leverage the GI tract in order to scale the benefit of bariatric surgery using the gut as a therapeutic target, because right now the penetrance of bariatric surgery is about 1% or less. And the idea by using the same pathways and introducing it through endoscopy is that we're, get, we're, we're getting to the concept of organ sparing. We could still leverage these endpoints of using the gut, but without losing the organ in the process. They offer additional safety uh, and they have le less long-term consequences on health as far as macro and micro vascul uh, macro and micro nutrient deficiency. And most importantly, they are less disruptive to the patient's lifestyle. That means patients are likely to maximize the compliance associated with utilizing these interventions, or at least that's the hope. Now, people love to say uh, it's unlikely we're going to get a bariatric endoscopic procedure that is going to reach the same efficacy as bariatric surgery, and that's a fair criticism. I think we're getting there. Eventually, we'll get there. I think within the next five years, we'll likely get there. But let's say with what we have right now, what is enough weight loss to have significant clinical benefit? And you could see from this meta-analysis that if you are working in a weight loss between 10 to 20%, you have maximized your improvement in most of the hard clinical endpoints that we care about, whether cardiovascular health, hypertension, sleep apnea, type 2, type 2 diabetes remission, and NAFLD. That means truly 
you do not need to make it to 30% total body weight loss to achieve these benefits. If you're working in the 10 to 20% total body weight loss, that is enough. And now we have a procedure that reliably gets us there in an outpatient fashion, uh, in a minimally invasive anatomy preserving fashion, and this procedure called endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. So to orient the viewer, what is this procedure? Uh, this procedure is a per oral, that means it's done through the patient's mouse, using a full thickness endoscopic suturing device that do, does two things. One, it reduces the length of the stomach and it tuberizes its greater curvature. So you're starting on the anterior wall, going to the greater curvature than posterior wall. You're introducing these U or O-shaped sutures and is suture according to the stomach and tuberize it to give you this shape. And this shape has clear physiological impact on appetite, both on, on satiety and satiation, so the patients could lose weight uh, without the uh, counter-regulatory physiological response of increased hunger and, uh, and, uh, and what have you. So this procedure is pretty much sure at this point. It's been around for 10 years, about 16,000 cases in the peer-reviewed literature, a very safe procedure with an SAE rate of about 1 to 1 1.2%. And you could see that at one year, the average weight loss is at about 17.5%. And that weight loss is maintained, at least in, in, in the published literature, at the three years horizon, which makes it a very appealing uh, treatment target. Uh, based on the published literature and on a large US-based randomized trial published in The Lancet, the FDA issued market uh, authorization for the use of endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty in patients with, uh, with, with uh, obesity and body mass uh, index between uh, 30 to uh, 50. And also the uh, NICE or the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence have evaluated the evidence and recommended the introduction of this procedure to the NHS uh, as a treatment for obesity. Now, we spent a lot of time defining the physiology of this procedure because that physiology is going to help us improving its efficacy and even durability further. And we realize that this procedure delays the gastric emptying, but does not, causes, but does not cause uh, gastroparesis. That means it delays gastric emptying, but does not affect gastric motility, as shown by these functional MRI studies. So what happened is here you see a stomach with contrast in it, in a functional stomach after endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, a few months after. You could see that the greater curvature is imbricated, you see a small pouch in the fundus that quickly accommodates to small meal to terminate that meal early. And then there's a delay by which that meal empties to the, small, to, the, uh, to the antrum. But once that meal makes it to the antrum, the antrum is still contractile and it will exit the stomach. So you have change in the accommodation of the stomach to feel full quicker. Delay in the gastric emptying without dysmotility because the antrum is still contractile and you exit the stomach, and that becomes the principle of this procedure. Now, based on our learnings of how this works, we now even improve the technique to enhance the durability. This is an ongoing randomized trial in collaboration with Irby, where we use APC. Uh, and adjust the technique a bit uh, in order to even improve the efficiency more. It's still an ongoing trial, but this is uh, one of the uh, patients that we've done uh, before. And you could see now we're improving the durability. We're improving the efficacy by now learning about the physiology and targeting the physiology. And you could see here, this is the retroflexion view of the fundus. The fundus is almost gone. And this patient lost about 23% of their total body weight loss at six months. So we're pushing that boundaries as well and more to come here. Now, when we go back to the value proposition, medications are there and they're getting better and we should celebrate that. But medication have costs associated with them have significant GI adverse events associated with them uh, and have patient compliance that there's significant discontinuation of these medication as well. Endoscopy like endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty achieve similar weight loss 
as these medications at the same time horizon is lower in cost and is associated with better compliance because of the less uh, GI adverse events. And this has been demonstrated in this cost effectiveness analysis published in GUT uh, by the Cornell group, showing that for class one, obesity ESG was the most effective. For class two and three, uh, laparoscopic sleeve uh, gastrectomy was the most effective. And uh, and in uh, and for semaglutide to be as cost effective uh, for class one obese uh, obesity, it would, would have to cost two hundred and ninety seven dollars a month, which we're still not there. But hopefully, eventually, we will uh, we will get uh, there. Now, techniques are improving, and we're pushing the the uh, the. Uh, Boundaries as far as durability. This is the incisionless operating platform that introduced full thickness plication uh, to the stomach in order to improve the durability of the gastric remodeling uh, because it distributes the forces of the plication uh, over, uh, over uh, two uh, nitinol baskets. Uh, this is a technique that called POSE 2.0 enfolding technique. And we're basically with this technique, we're starting in the distal body. We're uh, getting the anterior and posterior walls of the stomach, and we're embricating them using these two nitinol baskets. So with each plication, you're reducing the gastric volume by about 14 centimeters. And you could see with anywhere between six to eight plication, you have uh, achieved a robust and reproducible gastric remodeling that resembles a sleeve shape, as you will see uh, from uh, this image. This is a multi-center prospective study that we evaluated the durability of these plications, and you could see that the durability is quite good uh, in the two years horizon uh, of this uh, technique. Now, scalability is also an important principle, and now we're gonna have automated suturing coming on board, this is a device uh, that is promising to allow us to automate the process of gastric remodeling. Uh, and you could see it's a bougie-like device that you introduce to the stomach. And with the push of a button, you could imbricate the anterior and posterior walls and create a continuous suture line. And the hope here is a procedure like that could scale the, uh, the uh, paradigm of utilizing the gut for therapeutic uh, benefit for obesity and diabetes. Combination is, uh, is also a concept that we're gonna expect combining ESG with medication. This is a study from our colleagues at the Brigham and Women Hospital that shows that uh, uh, in a, a cohort where they introduced ESG with a GLP-1 agonist. The weight loss was at about uh, 24% compared to monotherapy alone, which the weight loss was about 17%. Regenerative medicine is going to be a, a key concept. Again, instead of targeting downstream effect, do we have now technology that could regenerate portions of the GI tract to have upstream benefit on type 2 diabetes. And here, the proximal gut or the duodenum is an important therapeutic target because it's a rich ecosystem that balances the microbiome, gut immunity, gut inflammation, and gut enteric nervous system and digestion. So it's really an ideal target. And we know that this is a complex target that, uh, that interacts between the microbiome, its metabolite, the mucosal surface and the enteric nervous system in order to regulate the metabolic response. And that structure gets inertic, inflamed, and dysfunctional in metabolic disease. Uh, this is a 3, 3D rendition of the small intestine showing that it looks like the central nervous system. It's very rich in nerves, especially what we call the enteric nervous system that interact with the mucosa. So here, this is a patient without metabolic disease. And now we're looking at their duodenum under narrowband imaging with water magnification. You could see it looks like the coral reef, very homogeneous, uh, very uh, intriguing. And now compare this image of a patient without metabolic disease to this patient with type 2 diabetes and obesity. 
you could see that this structure is getting more inflamed. There is more chyle deposit. There is more hyperemia and capillary expansion and heterogeneity in the crypt and villus, indicating that there's changes, physiologic changes that happens with, uh, with, with metabolic disease. And now could we regenerate these changes using pulse electrical field? I'm not gonna belabor you with the physics here, but the concept is, uh, could we uh, introduce a, a device uh, and this device administered pulse electrical field or what we call electroporation, which is athermal en energy. It's electrical pulses. And these electrical pulses are sufficient to regenerate a structure with a cell with cells in it that have phospholipid membrane without affecting the extracellular matrix. So you do not need to lift, you just need to, to push a pedal and now regenerate that structure to reestablish metabolic health uh, with this uh, paradigm. This is a patient in the trial. This is only in clinical trials at this point, about a hundred patients done globally. You could see uh, you put the device in the duodenum and you uh, push on a pedal and now you have a homogeneous uh, regeneration of that segment uh, in a simple outpatient procedure. And this is the picture before you, you administer the therapy. This is immediately after. Again, it's a thermal, so there's no coagulative necrosis. At one hour later, if you look before, this is the cryptan villus under MBI. After you could see like it looks like a carpet that you remove the carpet and now you're putting a new carpet and that's the new carpet that you placed four weeks later with this concept. And the idea is to regenerate metabolic health. In the early uh, FDA trials uh, in diabetic patients who are failing medical therapies on multiple agent, we've seen an hemoglobin A1C improvement of about 1.4, which is a significant improvement in this refractory cohort. Uh, and Dr. Bergman from Amsterdam introduced this technology with the use of a GLP-1 to remove insulin from patients. And you could see that with this treatment and GLP-1, most patients are able to get off insulin with improved glycemic parameters and maintain that over the year of the study. This is the continuous glucose monitor in the Amsterdam group before and after. You could see that uh, significant improvement in the time and range from 43 to 97%. And that's what's intriguing. This is a liver fat fraction before the treatment. Percent fat fraction in this patient was 23% you could see fat normalized out of the liver with, with these treatments indicating the robust metabolic benefits that you could see with these interventions. So the final two minutes, I'm gonna talk about really now pushing the envelope to getting similar efficacy uh, and durability of bariatric surgery, but with preserving the anatomy. And what made this possible for our field is the success of this surgical procedure called the single anastomosis gastrointestinal bypass. That means you need to create one connection between the stomach and the small intestines, and you need to restrict the gastric volume. This is, we're working on this technology with collaboration with Boston Scientific, but in essence, we could create now a modular gastric bypass where we have ESG to reduce the proximal stomach. We have a device to reduce the distal stomach. We could create a gastrojejunostomy and then place the device in order to create all the components of a gastric bypass in a modular system. This is how this modular system works. So it's a single anastomosis gastrointestinal bypass. It's based on the principle of dynamic equilibrium. So your first step is to create a gastrojejunostomy, whether you do it surgically, endoscopically, or via magnet, it doesn't matter. Then once you create this gastrojejunostomy, you're introducing this device uh, via uh, endoscopy. Uh, it's a simple wire pull. So once you secure wire from both ends, you pull it in place without fluoroscopy, just like you're pulling a PEC tube basically. And with, with having the device in place, you're bypassing the distal stomach and the small intestines. So here the device is being pulled in place. Once you reach its distance, you unhook the device. So it locks you. So you don't need to use fluoroscopy because it will lock you where the device is being deployed. And now you're introducing the device into the stomach. Then you're just pulling it in place. Uh, and with this, uh, now you're, uh, you're uh, achieving a gastrointestinal bypass. 
in a modular and anatomy preserving fashion. Uh, here you're uh, removing the suture that anchors the device on the gastrogenostomy side. Uh, and then the uh, the anti-migration system is is articulated in place, but the key importance here is there's no active fixation anywhere. The device is a series of uh, suspensions of nitinol springs, and these springs are uh, moving with uh, with the peristalsis of the GI tract without active fixation to maintain dynamic equilibrium so it does not cause damage to surrounding organs and it does not migrate. But you could see how you could combine this now with to create all the components of a gastrointestinal bypass endoscopically to take the weight loss to the second level. So in conclusion, the GI tract is front and central in weight and metabolic regulation. Endoscopic bariatric and metabolic therapies will play a significant role in the management of obesity and metabolic complication. They have clear physiological underpinning and represent a significant untapped therapeutic potential for the treatment of metabolic diseases. So the future is definitely bright. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Baram, for a fantastic talk and introduction and all the, you know, it was really very enlightening. And uh, we are now called upon Dr. Ravi Shankar, Ashok Kumar, to give us an overview about intragastric balloon. So over to you, Ravi. Thank you, organizers, for this opportunity. And uh, in this next 10 minutes, we'll be sharing uh, on uh, basic principles and some tips and tricks on uh, intragastric balloon for uh, BC. These are my uh, disclosures. And uh, as uh, Baham has highlighted, the problem that we are handling now is huge. And whatever uh, minimally invasive treatment options that we have, uh, it would obviously help us to penetrate uh, uh, the obesity pandemic and bring in more patients to seek treatment. So the first ever uh, space occupying device was the uh, Garrett Edwards uh, gastric bubble uh, that was introduced in 1982. Um, Although there was a lot of hype surrounding it with its introduction, but uh, quickly um, the device was out of favor because of the uh, suboptimal weight loss, the complications that happened, the mucosal ulcers that developed, and uh, the spontaneous balloon deflation and uh, migration causing obstruction uh, made this device um, go out of market pretty quick. However, uh, since that time until now, there has been long. Four of them are FDA approved. Um, and if you look at their um, um, uh, duration of employment, it varies somewhere from uh, six months to uh, 12 months. They can be implanted either endoscopically, they can be implanted by fluoroscopy. And if we look at uh, the weight loss results um, from randomized trials, we can see that the weight loss ranges somewhere between uh, uh, 10 to 15 percent with intragastric balloons. And uh, there are other uh, players as well, which are currently available in the European markets. They are all CE approved, uh, which is Metzil, Heliosphere, Enball, and um, the Lexball. Um, basically, the difference in terms of uh, different types of balloon is based on their material, is based on uh, what they are filled with, whether they are filled with air, whether they are filled with fluid, and uh, the duration of weight loss and how they are implanted, whether they are implanted by endoscopically or without endoscopy. So when we have so many uh, different types of balloon, uh, how do I choose my balloon? Uh, the basic principle which I use when I want to decide what type of balloon I have to choose is uh, the balloon number one has to be uh, very safe. It needs to have less complication rate. The inflation has to be just one time and it has a better tolerance. It's cheap and easy to use and induces good weight loss. And at the same time, um, uh, the balloon has to be durable because it takes time for patients uh, to uh, um, adhere to the diet and lifestyle changes for them to actually have a behavior change. It takes time. So having a, a, a device, an implantable device that stays for a longer duration of time is very effective uh, in order to bring in a behavior change. 
so with that uh in in our unit uh my own regular practice we usually use a fluid filled intragastric balloon uh we typically place this balloon for uh, 12 months and we uh, uh, fill them with uh, 650 cc of uh, uh, saline so uh, who are the patients who are suitable for intragastric balloon? These are uh, patients in Asia, in the, in um, uh, East, as we know that uh, metabolic diseases starts uh, manifesting even at a very lower BMI. Uh, the incidence of diabetes beyond a BMI more than 25 is high in, in Asia compared to uh, the Western world. So uh, the impetus for us to intervene at even lower BMI is more important for us to re reverse the metabolic complications of obesity. So we go in even lower sometimes with patients with BMI more than 25 when they have diabetes. And most importantly, as we know, any kind of endobiotic therapy has to function within a multidisciplinary team and it has to work in patients uh, who are willing to commit to life, uh, commit to lifestyle and behavior intervention. We typically try to avoid these procedures in patients who have prior esophageal or gastric surgery. And uh, in occasions, uh, in patients whose BMI are very high, we would uh, use this as a bridge therapy to help these patients before their bariatric surgery. So uh, some of the common uh, contraindications for uh, balloon implantation includes uh, esophagitis, which is severe, uh, high test hernia, typically more than um, uh, three to five centimeters. Patient who has very bad eosinophilic esophagitis, cancers, um, gastric ulcers, um, diverticulums, and if they have anatomical alterations, we avoid inserting intragastric balloons. Um, again, when it comes to uh, volume, uh, our volume is typically uh, um, 650 cc with methylene blue. We use a, a water jet function, so uh, you don't have to use a syringe to suction and uh, try to inflate the balloon when you use water jet function. Uh, the balloon inflation is just five minutes time and your uh, patient doesn't have to stay in hospital too long. It's an outpatient procedure. So when we talk about uh, volumes, typically we use um, a 650 cc. The volumes in the literature range from 400 to 700 ml. Um, uh, studies looking at uh, different fluid volumes and weight loss shows that the volume of fluid doesn't really make any difference in terms of weight loss. In fact, the higher the volume, uh, the less uh, is the risk of uh, uh, intolerance or ulcers or balloon uh, migrating, uh, causing a gastric outlet-like symptoms. So a higher volume always helps with uh, better weight loss. And using a water jet function will uh, make the procedure easier and um, your implantation time is shorter. The patient doesn't have to be on sedation for too long. You can do it, just do it as an outpatient. Any difference? Spectric ulcers, helicobacter pylori is very high, so we prefer to do it by endoscopy. After you do a complete assessment, bring your endoscope back to proximal esophagus at around 20 centimeters. It, it opens up the UES, then you can slide the balloon. Once the balloon goes in, it doesn't matter where you place the balloon, whether you place it in the distal body, mid body, fundus, uh, it doesn't really make a big difference in terms of weight loss. So you can see here, we start pressing on the water pump. The balloon inflates very quickly and then um, uh, the procedure is done. Uh, after you inflate, you can see that the balloon preferentially moves towards the fundus. So you can see that uh, whether you place it in antrum or fundus doesn't really make a big difference because the balloon is always mobile. And sometimes when the patient is uh, super obese and you're trying to do this procedure without um, airway protection, it is possible that the balloon doesn't enter the UES. Uh, it just gets uh, stuck at the level of uh, cricopharynx. In those instances, what you just need to do is just hyperextend the neck. When you hyperextend the neck, it opens up your uh, uh, the cricopharynx and use your endoscope to slightly guide your uh, balloon. Uh, then uh, you can push it down easily. If you try to blindly try to push the uh, the balloon sheet, sometimes it, uh, it really leads to uh, respiratory compromise, patient aspirating, and complicating the procedure. So here, uh, with gentle neck extension, you can see that the balloon catheter could be advanced very easily. Um, while balloon is effective, 
in a percentage of patients, you may see that they may return to your clinic at about six to eight weeks with symptoms of uh, uh, intolerance. Typically, they present with rectal vomiting, unable to tolerate um, uh, uh, any of the liquid diet that you provide, present with ab abdominal discomfort. And when you do an endoscopy, you can see there is large amount of fluids, the patient having extremely uh, bad reflux esophagitis. Uh, typically, it happens around six to uh, eight weeks' time. Uh, not all patients with um, intragastric balloon uh, tend to manifest this. Uh, the early balloon removal rate typically is in the range of 17, uh, 7 to 15% after intragastric balloon. And the reason why it happens is because the way intragastric balloon works is uh, the balloon leads to increase in gastric retention by delaying uh, gastric emptying, such as in this case, you can see that uh, there is large amount of food residue that is still uh, present in the stomach. Uh, let's say if we try to implant gastric balloon in a cohort of patients who already have a, a, a delayed gastric emptying to begin with, then these are uh, uh, the group of patients who typically present with uh, um, early balloon removal and intolerance. Uh, if we want to personalize treatment in terms of who would benefit better from uh, a balloon placement is by actually measuring their uh, baseline gastric emptying. If we can uh, categorize them into different categories, like those who have a, uh, incre or who have a delayed gastric emptying to begin with, if we place an intragastric balloon in this group of patients, they are at most six-fold uh, higher risk of having their balloon removed because of intolerance. So those who don't have a delayed gastric emptying to begin with are the best who may respond better to intragastric balloons. So in such situations, when patients present with uh, intolerance, um, we may have to uh, extract the balloon. We always do balloon extraction under endotracheal intubation. Uh, the reason being, you can see that there is a lot of food residues that are still present in the stomach. And when you want to pull out a balloon with food residue, you want to minimize uh, aspiration risk. So it's better to protect the airways and use dedicated devices where available to help you uh, uh, remove the balloon. Uh, in the absence where these devices are not available, our usual Olympus or Boston injection catheters can be used. But the process of um, um, balloon rem removal it's a little bit longer uh, than usual. So let's take a look uh, about how we uh, extract an intragastric balloon. There are certain steps you don't want to rush in. You don't want to approach the balloon from a distance. When you approach from a distance, the balloon knows you slip with the needle sticking out of your catheter. You may inadvertently post, uh, poke the gastric wall causing bleeding or even perforation. You rather would want to stay closer to the balloon for you to uh, effectively remove the balloon. So, uh, and also be uh, gentle, don't be forceful. When you are again forceful in uh, advancing your catheter, you are going to uh, cause uh, injury to the gastric mucosa. Look at the light source um, uh, on top of the balloon, place your catheter next to it and, gen and then gently advance it. Advance until um, uh, almost um, three fourths of your uh, entire length of catheter is inside the balloon. And then again, using the same water jet principle, now you just have to reverse the catheter in your water jet and you step on the water jet catheter, uh, the balloon uh, fluid gets um, sucked in very quickly so you don't have to manually aspirate uh, uh, the balloon to deflate it. Uh, thereby you can keep your procedure sh time shorter, uh, the requirement of anesthesia goes down, the need for patients to stay in hospital also goes down. And you suck until all the water is removed. You don't want any fluid to stay back. And that's reflected by your edges of your balloon looking like a, a very thin uh, um, a piece of, uh, like a cracker. So you can remove the balloon either in retroflexion. Um, sometimes uh, removing an introflexion is not always possible. Then you remove it in uh, antiflexion, having a clear view, try to grasp it. Uh, then secure your catheter at the endoscopic channel size and then uh, pull through. There will be instances where when you go in, you see that the balloon is already half uh, uh, deflated. Um, in such instances, it may not always be possible for you to uh, put your catheter inside the balloon to suction all the fluid. In such instances, if you try to pull out the balloon thinking that there is not much fluid, it will just um, uh, squeeze out through the uh, G junction and we can pull it out. 
Uh, what happens sometimes is you must notice that the balloon can be slightly bigger. It's like as if you're dilating the gastroesophageal junction with CRE balloon, you start seeing uh, tears and bleeding and all those which you can ideally avoid when you have deflated the balloon uh, completely. Such as in this case, when we pulled out uh, the balloon that was not completely deflated, it caused some mucosal abrasions and bleeding. Uh, again, uh, when you go in, uh, the balloon may be deflated almost uh, 80%, but it's not completely deflated. There's no way you can put your uh, catheter inside the balloon to deflate it. In such instances, what you can do is like how our uh, water shower is, you can try to make multiple pokes in the, uh, in the balloon. And then when you pull it and then apply pressure against the G-junction, there will be a shower of water going into the stomach. Thereby, it deflates uh, all the water inside the balloon and then you can uh, easily swipe it through the esophagus without having much issues. And uh, lastly, when all these measures fail, uh, you can use other tools. You can use uh, a scissors. You make a cut, open the balloon, and then uh, put your endoscope closer, go inside the balloon, and then uh, suction all the fluid. Thereby, uh, you completely empty uh, the balloon and make it thin allowing you to uh, easily remove the, uh, uh, the balloon. So now uh, we have deflated it completely and you can see that the balloon can be uh, pulled out with ease. And lastly, uh, sometimes uh, not all patients turn up uh, to uh, your follow-up on time to remove your balloon. The balloon may be there for two years. Sometimes they present to you two years later to help you remove the balloon. And when you go in, you see the balloon is coated with a lot of fungus and the balloon material has actually uh, degraded. Uh, when you have such instances, removing such balloons can be difficult uh, because the balloon material has completely degraded. When you try to uh, hold with your grasping forceps, the balloon just tears apart, such as in this case, you can see we try to uh, catch it. Uh, the, the balloon material has degraded. When we try to pull, it breaks apart. So in that instance, you would want to grasp as many folds of balloon as possible. Grab two or three or four folds using your forceps and pull it out so that if one breaks, you, uh, you have still have two or three more folds to anchor on uh, to ex extract. Okay. So in essence, um, um, intragastric balloon is a very safe treatment. When we, um, there are a lot of uh, um, reports saying um, uh, mortality associated with uh, gastric balloons a few years ago. When, but when uh, we looked at the data, you can see that the mortality with intragastric balloon is uh, no different from the commonly performed endoscopic procedures. It's as low as 0.03% uh, uh, in practice. So it's reassuring that these devices are effective uh, to help patients manage their uh, weight related issues. However, having said that, complications are still possible with intragastric balloon. Some of them include uh, gastric hyperinflation spontaneously. You can see that uh, um, uh, because of um, um, fungal uh, infestation or contamination of the water, it ferments and then produces gas, making the balloon to expand, uh, causing patient to have discomfort. When we encounter this, we, uh, we remove the balloon. And uh, perforations, although very rare, uh, can sometimes happen if the patients are taking um, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs and they're not compliant with uh, their uh, um, proton pump inhibitor use during the balloon, then you can uh, see the patients presenting with the perforations. In most instances, these perforations, uh, if detected early, if presented early, can be managed with endoscopy uh, rather than going for surgery. There is not much of con contamination. However, uh, a surgical consult is important uh, because most of these patients have a lot of gastric residue and you don't want to risk peritonitis. Uh, some other complications is um, uh, perforations with other types of balloons too, though uh, like the sparse balloon, which has a catheter, can, uh, can uh, migrate, can perforate, can sometimes cause uh, deep pulses from the catheter. Um, the balloon, if uh, the fluid volume is lower, can uh, migrate to the... Uh, uh, pylorus causing uh, GOO-like symptoms, or even sometimes the patient may present with a uh, uh, migrated balloon all the way down that they present with foreign body from their bottom. So in a sense, uh, while all these complications which we have stated can happen, but the incidence of these happening are very, very low.
Uh, so intragastric balloons are safe and effective treatment options for obesity. Uh, they should be considered uh, a, a, as an option uh, in uh, patients who would benefit better and personalizing it to minimize intolerance would be the way to go when we use uh, intragastric balloons. Um, certainly, there is a risk of weight recidivism after the balloon comes out at about one year. Uh, in such instances, now we have uh, other options. We also have uh, wonderful drugs which can complement uh, uh, further weight loss or even maintain the weight loss over longer duration of time. With that, I, I thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you, Ravi, for a wonderful comprehensive talk on intragastric balloon. And talking about weight recidivism, uh, let's invite Dr. Anna Karolina Hoff for her talk. Anna, you're on. Of course. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bapai, Dr. Trupesh, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, let's share the screen. The burden of weight loss regain is probably much higher than we think. Most of those patients do not return to their bariatric surgeons due to sentiments like shame or failure. We all know that weight regain is actually normal until the red light is turned on. So we can expect up to 10% regain when you use the nadir as a baseline. The numbers usually increase after 18 to 24 months and it's due to hunger hormones getting back to normal, or as simple as that, the return to old habits that once turned patients into obese. So it's the lack of physical exercise, the bad eating behavior, and the emotional eating. I'm here to talk about the Tory procedure and to emphasize things that happen on a daily basis as interventional endoscopies. I can refer to you really relevant studies about safety, about efficacy, not only regarding one year or two years, but five to 10 years of the durability of the procedure. What's the best call for each case that you are presented and which we are going to discuss by that, the size of the pouch, the size of the outlet and the necessity of combining argon plasma coagulation today. Which is the best patient benefiting from this procedure, knowing that we also have we loss medication and we have TORI, and also a combination of TORI and weight loss medication. And bottom line, we have the surgical revisions of the gastric bypasses. So, number one, the average stomach presents a pouch that measures between three and five centimeters and an outlet that is wider than 1.4 centimeters. This should be the perfect scenario. You have plenty of space to maneuver using either a Gen 2 Apollo and the surgery or even an SX device. And the only parameter that you will consider is the diameter of the outlet. I would say that if it's close to 1.5 centimeters, I would use the argon plasma coagulation in a lighter way so that we can minimize the risk of strictures. So if the outlet is less than two centimeters, I would prefer using a lower potency and restricting the width and depth of the burnt to a yellowish aspect that is going to work more as a marking to my suture. If the pouch, the outlet, is wider than two centimeters, the argon plasma coagulation can be used with a potency of 60 watts, 0.8 liters per minute, that creme brulee like burned to achieve all the layers of the tissue and to aim for the whole diameter, paying attention on the width of the figuration, creating a halo of one centimeter approximately. We are calling uh, Urbi. 1200s or 3. For marking, you can use the same 8 liters per minute, but you have to lower the potency for 40 watts and you don't surpass 0.5 centimeters in width. Moving to the second situation, a pouch that is 5 centimeters or more in length and the same applies in width as well. 
If you're able to retroflex your double channel, that means you have a wide pouch and just approaching the outlet is going to create a worse situation in the long term. Sometimes you're going to end up with a one centimeter outlet, which is our goal, which is fantastic, but the gastric emptying is delayed and you can give your patient GERD, which is not exactly the outcome we want to solve problems, not to create them. In this case, you should also approach the pouch. Consider what I said before, using the APC for marking, but, or as a method combined uh, to do endoscopic suturing, depending on the diameter of the outlet. But you will use another suture to diminish the pouch, leaving it to two to three centimeters, and therefore providing the feeling of early satiation. Still, third situation, where you have a small outlet that does not require any endoscopic approach because the diameter is below 1.5 centimeter, yet the pouch is long and or wide. It's very intuitive that you're going just to approach the pouch and by saying that, you're going to use a suture pattern that can be a rectangle or a zigzag, whatever suits better for that particular anatomy. That being said, we can move on to the second part of this lecture, how to choose wisely your patient. If a patient looks you up, complaining of 10% weight regained, it's more likely that you indicate a weight loss medication instead of an endoscopic procedure to start with. And you follow the protocol, and if the patient isn't at, the weight loss isn't achieved as, as expected, then you can indicate the TORI procedure. By escalating the strengths of every possibility, you are showing the patient transparency and therefore you're not pushing the procedure. So if the patient comes back of the, or, or the weight regain is superior than 15%, we can, without hesitating, offer the endoscopic procedure. By stating that, I have to remind us the limitations of our procedure. We have an average of 20% weight loss when followed by a good multidisciplinary team, and we cannot forget that the procedure can be also combined with weight loss medication, and therefore you can treat safely patients that have a weight regain up to 30% because it's a feasible goal to reach. Weight regain that surpasses 30% can also be treated with an endoscopic procedure with or without combination with weight loss medications. Hence, we have to pinpoint that maybe the surgical revision is the best indication because we have to rely on two other variants apart from the percentage weight loss required, and those are age and comorbidities. One scenario is, is if in front of you stands a 26-year-old woman with a weight regain of 40% but with comorbidities, but they are balanced or without comorbidities at all, and therefore she can be a good candidate for TOR with or without weight loss medications to achieve her goals because we have time in favor. We can, are not in a rush. One week ago, a 64-year-old woman came looking for me for a TORI procedure, but she had almost 50% of weight regain. She was taking three different medications for high blood pressure. She had not only steatosis, but liver fibrosis, and she was also diabetic. I explained through very thoroughly the full extension of the limitations of the endoscopic method, and that time was against her in the, her race towards health. Therefore, I referred her to a surgical revision of the gastric bypass because I need speed to provide her the best results that I can. The art of putting every card on the table and explaining the effects, side effects, indications, contraindications, and limitations to each and every method. Of course, we have stunning results with endoscopic procedures, and I myself am a very enthusiastic doctor that believes that every day that goes by, we are enhancing our endoscopic tools and discovering new medications and the combination of minimally invasive techniques 
with weight loss medications are going to avoid 90% of surgery, uh, just to be fair with the surgeons. But until now, we have to avoid the headaches, the lawsuits, and the infamous culture of cancellation. Nowadays, if the patient isn't happy with the treatment, even before you are trialed, you're already labeled guilty in social media. As I'm speaking to you today in this 10 minutes I was given, and I do have to thank this amazing opportunity. Uh, and uh, you are here watching a toy procedure. The standard way that I perform at angioscopy, if the issue is just the diameter of the outlet, I call this a 70% per string suture. By the 70% rule, I don't have to use a balloon in order to cinch because I can see the space that I'm leaving behind as the new outlet. I also prefer the double channel without the overtube so I can maneuver better inside the pouch and if I think that I'm losing insufflation, I can ask one of my nurses to hold the esophagus in order to complete procedure. So 10 minutes for lecture and 10 minutes to complete the TOR procedure. Thank you once again. Thank you very much for your attention and feel free to ask me whatever questions you might have. Thank you, Anna. Thank uh, you. I hope it wasn't kinking so much. Yeah, we, we did have a little bit of issue intermittently, but we understand the internet uh, uh, at your place with the storm and other things. Uh, that's okay. So let's have our last talk on endoscopic management of bariatric surgery complications by none other than Dr. Rakesh Kalapala from the Asian Institute of Gastroenterology, Hyderabad, India. Over to you, Rakesh. Rakesh, there. Okay. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Amol and Dr. Truktesh for inviting me. And I think 10 minutes to finish this topic is a Herculean task, but I'll try to summarize and then showcase what exactly we can do in this. So bariatric surgery, we all know it's a fantastic established concept, but do the bariatric surgeons do have a nightmare quite often. And uh, I don't want to go into the different bariatric surgery procedures which are being done because uh, that's been not uh, an area of discussion. But what I want to tell you is bariatric surgery is the most effective treatment. But of course, with a few complications in few percent of patients like fistulas and leaks, and mind you, this is the risk of death is not because of the complication, but the inability to diagnose this at apt time at early diagnosis. So that's where we quite often fumble and then lose the patients. So we all know about the leak and the fistula. The basic definition is communication between the intra and extra luminal compartments. Fistula is an abnormal com uh, communication between the two epithelial surfaces. So what happens, the reasons for these leaks and fistulas are one is the inadequate vascularization, the tension on the suture line, the staples when they put the failure to you know, oppose them properly and also the downstream stenosis. Coming to the leaks, we have the sleeve gastrectomy, which are the most common uh, of leaks, the, especially the proximal sleeve leaks are very common because of the relative ischemia of that area at the, or because of short gastric arteries and also increase in the pressure in that area. Primarily, the sleeve leaks are divided into type 1, 2, and 3. I'm not going to go into the depth of it, but it's more of an anatomical classification what they have. And sleeve leak, gastrectomy leaks are divided into this classification of acute, early, later, and chronic. The reason for this is the first two are the things which you pick up early have the best outcome. The later, that is, chronic leaks will have a little delayed outcome and probably you might not get uh, the sufficient endoscopic uh, uh, recovery and they might go for surgery. Then ruined by bypass is another commonly done surgery where also you have the leaks. So leaks at different levels of this RYGB will have, have been classified into type 1 to type 6. And coming to management of the leaks, the first and foremost, as I told you, early pickup, early diagnosis within the hospital post-op and then control of sepsis before it percolates into the different uh, parts of the body, antibiotics, nutrition support, very important because you can't feed this patient. So you need to secure a good nasojejunal tube or a peg tube, depending on the anatomy. 
and then keep uh, nutrition as best as you can. And of course, when you have initial days of two, three, four days of a established uh, leak, uh, which leads to early sepsis, then you always secure it with a good intervention radiology team backing up by putting a pigtail catheter percutaneously. And as I told you, the success rate of endoscopic treatment less than three weeks is around 90 to 100%. And if it is more that is delayed pickup or delayed leaks, it is 70%. So early treatment is the key. And uh, the clinical success of leaks is 100% almost. We have different uh, uh, instruments to tackle this. And of course, fistulas is around 70% because they have their own merits and limitations. So primarily the endoscopic techniques, what we use are the closure techniques, covering techniques, and draining techniques. Closure techniques is uh, basically using this using the tissue sealants or the OVSCO clips, the conventional clips, and of course the endoscopic suturing device, which is an extrapolation of the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. You can use the Apollo overstitch, which is very, very commonly available. Then the covering techniques are you cover the fistula either with this self-expandable metallic stents called the mega stent, or in very rare cases, the ASD device closures, what the cardiologists use, the cardiac septal defect uh, occluder. And in the draining techniques, you have the septotomy, the endoscopic vacuum therapy, and also if you have a leak uh, beyond the uh, cavity beyond the leak, then you can place double pigtail stents, either endoscopic ultrasound guided or even the blind endoscopic guided. So the, primarily what is being commonly used is a self-expandable metallic stents. And uh, these are long stents, unlike the short stents, what we use in conventional esophageal and biliary. And these are called mega stents. There are a couple of companies which manufacture. The Korean Tewung is the one which is very commonly used. And this in your video you can show, see the leak at the GE junction, exactly the anastomotic site. So what, has, what we do is you just, like any other conventional deployment of a, uh, esophageal stems, you create a contrast blab so that under fluoro you mount in the guide wire and then over the guide wire you put this stent. Very easily deployable, the simple, any like any other stent, as you see here, it will cover the uh, anastomotic site leak and then it will remain there. You, ne you need not put it for a long time, usually two to three weeks is what uh, we put it and then take out, then do a, a leak study. And the second one is the OVSCO clip, as we all know, padlock clip, not widely available in India, but, but we have it in some centers. OVSCO is the most commonly used clip, especially when you have a little delayed leaks in the third or fourth week, small leaks. OVSCO has got a, its own uh, merits. Uh, and OVSCO clip, again, is used in some cases where you want to put the stent and prevent the migration. Then uh, this is one, actually, one, uh, one of our cases where the stent was kind of migrating. So we had to fix this stent with the OVSCO stent fixer, which aptly suits there. And we need around three to four weeks of the stent to be stayed. So this is a very good uh, uh, tool for you know maintaining the stent uh, patency and preventing the migration. Meta-analysis of this uh, metallic stents uh, showed around 70 to 80% success rate, as I told you. Then the vacuum therapy is one which is again commonly used where you have uh, Intracavitary and intraluminal are the two types where you soak the sponge with saline outside and then lubricate it into the uh, cavity where you have the large rent and then keep it there. So it acts as a sucking mechanism where it will absorb all the secretions and then that will create a, a kind of a sterile env environment by this vacuum sponge which will assist. And as I told you, the difficulty in placing is the challenging, challenging placement in removal is because through the mouth and you need multiple exchanges. That's the only thing probably every two to three days you need to you know, change the sponge. So this is again the one of the videos, but uh, for lack of time, I'll just uh, show you a glimpse of how it looks at the end when you do. So this is the sponge which is put into the cavity and then that gives the sucking mechanism. So another one is the double pigtail stents. Again, this can be done as I told you, the endoscopic ultrasound guided or even blind guided where you put in a stent, one pigtail in the stomach cavity, one in the uh, fluid collection cavity, and then all the fluid drains down into this. Then ASD closure device, again, I'll just run through. So I'll just show you a glimpse of it. This is again commonly used in our unit. You need a expert cardiologist and a pulmonologist and a gastroenterologist and endoscopist because you have it. Uh, if you want to especially tackle the tracheoesophageal ones, uh, you need a bronchoscope and an endoscope assisted. So exactly it looks like this, where you have the 
bronchial end uh, with a, a flange in the bronchial end and one flange in the esophageal end. So this is again used in GE junction leaks also. So uh, the one caveat in this is chronic leaks, the stents are not that effective. And as I told you, the chronic leaks and fistulas, you need a bridge therapy. I mean, stents might be a bridge therapy before a definitive treatment. One important thing what I want to emphasize here is endoscopic techniques where it is not indicated. We know all it is indicated, where it is not indicated is tissue, tissue sealant should not be tried in early acute and early leaks. Cap mounted clips, again, if it is a larger diameter orifice, more than two centimeters, you should not use. Then suturing uh, is again, if they have a small defects. And as I told you, the ASD closure devices, septotomy and double pigtail stents are only for small collections uh, without any major uh, damage. So I'll skip this. Then second important thing, what we commonly encounter is a stenosis or strictures post uh, surgery. So you always use the balloon dilatation, which is a standard of care. And in some, you, you can use the short SEMs, which are available, the fully covered SEMs or the lumen exposing metallic stents. So these are the strictures which we quite all commonly encounter post anastomosis strictures. And the CRE balloons are the best ones which are used. And if they are refractory to this, then obviously you can go to the next level of putting in the SEMs. And as I told you, it's not a single session. You, you need around one to three sessions depending on the uh, size of the uh, stricture and also the fibrosis, how much of fibrosis it has caused. But by and large, usually three to four sessions are required sometimes. And another important area of stenosis is ruined by bypass where you have the gastro jejunal anastomosis stenosis. So if, if the conventional therapies don't work out, then you can also give steroid injections like how you give for the corrosive strictures and incisional therapy, and as I told you, the stents. So the sleeve stenosis, if you see, if it is uh, less than two to three weeks, you try to do conservatively more than two to three weeks, the endoscopic treatment, you have the balloon dilatation stents, or if they are refracted to all of them, then you have to do a redo surgery, which again is a surgical part. Bleeds again, very common. It happens either through, if it is intra-op, then surgeons obviously tackle, but there are, most of the bleeds happen post-op, in the first 24 to 48 hours. And like any other uh, bleed in a GA track, we have the, through the scope clips, hemospray, OTSC, padlocks, and endosuturing. And usually by and large, what we use is the, through the scope clips, the conventional Boston or the uh, Cook ones. And uh, in some cases you have the OSCO clips. So this is one video where, which I want to share in one of our things. And in fact, what I want to say is a surgical colleague, your bariatric surgeon colleague should be wise enough to pick this up and then also bold enough or magnanimous to you know refer this to you or if he himself is an endoscopist like Amol then they can do both surgery and endoscopy together. So this is again a conventional clips which you have placed for a small spurter probably a vessel and uh, with this so it's a post-op second post-op day so you can see the bleeding being arrested. Another one this is another little scary one a, sp a spurter this is exactly after 24 hours of post-op the patient is wheeled in from surgical ICU to our endoscopy theater. And we used an OSCO clip, which has got a fantastic uh, effect of uh, achieving hemostasis. And uh, this is a very easily doable procedure, as we all know. And you see complete hemostasis. So another one is uh, what surgeons are quite often doing nowadays, the uh, one anastomosis gastric bypass. So this is again by our surgical colleague where after 48 hours, suddenly he has seen the patient having a drop in hemoglobin with giddiness and tachycardia. Then he came to the endoscopic theater with the patient. I went in and then initially I couldn't see anything. So I have to go in depth and then probably the site, which is highly, um, uh, support, I mean, uh, uh, highly vulnerable is the gastro jejunostomy site. And as you see, we have gone deep into the uh, anastomotic area. So this is nicely, nicely anastomosis, but you can see a big spurt. Uh, of course, probably, a, uh, I'm not sure it's a vessel. Or, I mean, it's a, probably a vein or a small artery. So then uh, we, I could go through and then put a conventional hemoclips. Two or three were placed. And then immediately the bleed stopped. So this is something which is a uh, kind of uh, uh, multidisciplinary approach where if you have everything in-house, all these things will be easily preventable and then you can uh, stop a big catastrophe which happens because post-operatively going in again, doing a surgery is not uh, 
you know that uh, easy like uh, how we do in the conventional endoscopy so i'll just go to the next one so just to conclude uh, what i I would say is post-surgical leaks are the most feared complication for a surgeon, physician, or anybody. Then increasing incidence of sleeve gastrectomy, there is increased incidence of sleeve leaks. As I told you, I re-emphasize again, early pickup is very important because the early you pick up, the best will be the outcomes in a non-surgical way. Important to consider timings in surgery, leak size, and distal obstruction are there. And endoscopic armament, we have now so many things which are coming up in our end. Um, therapeutic endoscopy. So I think 90 to 95% of the times we are wise enough to tackle any of this post bariatric endoscopic surgery complications. And most of these post surgery leaks can be managed effectively through an endoscopic approach. As I told you, it's a multidisciplinary team. You need a good intensivist, a nutritionist, bariatric surgeon, and of course, an endoscopist, intervention radiologist to tackle this. And internal drainage, as I told you, unlike the earlier percutaneous drains and or it's a paradigm shift in this uh, treating this post bariatric surgery leaks. And of course, as we have seen, and we are going through multiple uh, devices in our endoscopic rooms coming up. Now it's uh, easy to treat more than 95 to 98% of this post bariatric surgery complications. And uh, uh, what I feel personally is it's not, not less than any of the therapeutic endoscopies because you need a def definite uh, good skills for tackling these post-bariatric surgery complications, uh, just uh, like how we have uh, complicated ERCPs or endoscopic ultrasound drainages. So I'll stop here and then I, uh, we can conclude with this. Thank you, guys. And uh, great session. We have lots of questions pouring in. Um, I will save some time and uh, basically start with Rakesh. So Rakesh, the question for you is that uh, how, what would you use in uh, post-gastric sleeve uh, uh, bariatric laparoscopic uh, gastrectomy um, when it leads to angular stenosis, especially at uh, the initial part, the proximal end? Would you use a dilation balloon or would you directly go to stents? Uh, so it's a very good question, Truptesh. Ideally, the first thing what we have to see is to measure the diameter and the length of the stenosis with a good conventional contrast study. And then once probably if it is a short stenosis, then CRE balloon dilatation will have the best outcomes. If it is a long stenosis or after doing two or three CRE dilatation attempts and it is still very fibrotic and refractory, then I would prefer a stent. At the first go, if the stenosis is short, then balloon is my choice rather than a stent. Right. And uh, all the other faculties can also add to it if you have any different points. All right. So the second question is from Barham. It's like, uh, just like bariatric surgeons, they do a, a laparoscopic uh, gastric sleeve and they have a measuring device in order to approximate the volume of the stomach during the surgery. Uh, do you use such device in order to see how much of the gastric sleeve uh, circumference that you should be doing while doing ESGs in your practice? Yeah, so thank you for that question. I think the final volume metrics uh, is still not a settled issue uh, as far as the procedure goes. But the surgeons use a bougie, and uh, you could argue on the size of the bougie, so it's not a specific uh, measuring device. And we have an auto automatic bougie when we do the procedure, which is the endoscope itself. So the endoscope diameter, the double channel, is uh, about 11 to 12 millimeters with the cap on it. And that becomes your calibration. Now, it's uh, so it's it's not a perfect science at this point, but the fact that the endoscope is there while you're creating the procedure is a, a similar concept to the bougie that's used in the surgical version of it. Thank you. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, Baram, I think uh, there's a question from Jan Kral. Uh, and uh, he's congratulated to you on an amazing lecture as well. And his question is that do you think we will be able to get a 20% total body weight loss with EAG in 12 months in future? Because he feels that Apollo seems to be the best solution and endomino is not so effective. That's what they thought. 
and the first end of zip data will be available from Prague and Italy by the end of this year. But they expect about 14% of uh, total body weight loss with the end of zip. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, my thoughts is yes, we will be embarking in the short term on weight loss that will surpass 20% with uh, with uh, with current and upcoming platform. Uh, the idea is uh, if we uh, see any fields of medicine that's evolving, innovation takes time and takes patience and lots of uh, lots of iteration to get it to work. The initial medications that we had were resulting in two to three percent total body weight loss, and now we have medications decades later that are getting to the twenty percent total body weight loss. I think we're going to see that, and it's not going to be years; it's going to be months before we start seeing that because things are progressing in this field quite rapidly. Thank you, and he yeah. also asked another question to Ravi. So, Ravi, do you think Medellin Blue is necessary for? The balloons, I mean, that's, that's the question Jalka has asked you. So what are your thoughts on that? Is Ravi there? I think the way, uh, uh, the way how uh, methylene blue functions basically is by, uh, uh, when you add this color, when there is spontaneous balloon leaks, uh, methylene blue gets absorbed by kidneys and your uh, urine color changes uh, to green. So uh, by having this color change, it's kind of a, like a warning signal to the patient to say that uh, it's time you go and seek a consult rather than having a balloon that is just filled with saline when the patient doesn't know if the balloon is leaking or not. So it's a good practice to add a, a methylene blue, um, especially if you are practicing in a place where the patient lives very far away and then they have to travel all the way to, to come to you for consult. Uh, however, it's not always strictly needed. Okay. Thank you, Anna. There's a question for you. And uh, it's also one of my questions is that when we do tour and uh, normally uh, we see that some patients, they come back with broken sutures despite of uh, taking the uh, suturing and they don't have appropriate weight loss. Do you in your practice do a double suturing in order to make sure that there is some assurance that the sutures won't break? Yeah, of course. Uh, I try to not just do the 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 purse string if an, it's a seventy percent, but I place also three other stitches in order to lose the the pressure on that particular purse string. But of course, if the patient comes back with a broken suture, you can try to resuture it, or you can apply the APC on it uh, if it's just a matter of the outlet. And you can use the APC for the whole set conference, and and therefore in six to eight weeks you have, uh, for the figuration is is up is going to to lead to a, a fibrosis, and therefore you're going to have the outlet reduction. Uh, if you're saying if the suture breaks on the the pouch and is a bigger pouch. Uh, it's very common to see here in Brazil pouches that are 10 centimeters in length and eight centimeters. I think the day before yesterday, I, I performed a tour and I, I, kept, I couldn't even see those gastric folds because the pouch was so big and it was, it was indeed a gastric bypass. But I could see uh, yet some three to four folds. So it was a big pouch. And if the suture breaks, uh, you can try to resuture it, but sometimes the failure of the pouch, and I, I know this is not your question, it's because the patient uh, isn't responding to the restriction itself. So sometimes you have to think as a surgeon, as a, as a, a surgeon that I am, I have to refer, even though I don't want, I have to, to think about surgical options and then to, to transform this into a sleeve because this patient for sure is not responding well to the gastric bypass and therefore to a sleeve and therefore to a sadis or a sasi and therefore we can discuss this for right. hours and hours. Amol, you're muted, Amol. Amol, you're muted. So I have a question to Rakesh, actually a continuation of the question that Tropesh asked about the angular stenosis. 
So what do you think about the tunneling procedure that uh, the Sao Paulo group had also described about, you know, to open up the stenosis, the angular stenosis after the sleeve uh, sleep gastrectomy? Yeah, so I feel if it is a refractory fibrotic stricture, not uh, responding to the conventional therapy, definitely, yes, that is something which you have to really look upon. Because, you know, instead of doing the surgery, redo surgery again, that is definitely a uh, good choice, provided you have a very bad fibrotic structure. Right. That is true. Ruptesh? Yeah. So, question for, um, I would say, Rakesh again, in continuation with Tor, uh, as we know that Ovesco, they have come up with a new device called the BARS device and normally used for Tors and... Uh, that's an upcoming thing uh, right now in the bariatric world. And uh, I've seen um, your institution has done a couple of uh, live endoscopy cases. So how do you explain that to our audience who are totally new to this endobariatric world? About yeah, it's pretty, uh, the people who have done the EFTR, it's just like that. And a pretty bulky device. Only thing is uh, the experience what we have. If you have a throw, I mean, the narrowing of the post required area. So, probably sometimes you, because it's a 20.5 mm shaft. So, you need to dilate it initially if it is not going easily and uh, a little bit of learning curve. But I would say, compared to TOR, in this, the anastomotic side diameter should be between 2 to 2.5. It is very large, then it might not work the way it has to. So, 2.5 to 3 is the max should be the GJ stromal site enlarged diameter to have a better outcome. And would so, one bars clip uh, suffice? Uh, usually, you know, it will take a hell lot of time to get one bars into. The second hasn't been tried, but let me see for the next case. So, so Barham also has got an experience. He was with me sometime. I know, before. I know, I know Barham and uh, I saw that case yeah. and it was an interesting one. Uh, so, Baram, last question to you, and uh, this is after that we are going to uh, wrap up, is that I had uh, seen uh, basically a paper, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is regarding quite before performing TOR, uh, just the revitalization of that stoma size, uh, you do an ESD basically around the area and then perform um, suturing. Uh, how and what, what exactly is the science behind that? Is yeah. it just fibrosis? Yeah, no, the science behind that, which is which is well known if the, of those who follow the surgical literature and the history of surgery, is the best healing happens from two cut surfaces, right? So you have to have a cut surface to improve the healing of the structure. So the idea is an extension of that, is you're creating a cut surface that you approximate and the healing and the fibrotic reaction is more robust. And uh, I think it's a true statement. We, 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 the, the, uh, the, the Dr. Thompson's group and Brigham published their experience. We're going to put our experience out there in a large cohort, showing that it is more durable and likely more effective as well than traditional suturing, whether with just APC or with, uh, with, with only suturing. But of course, in this field, any additional intervention has risk benefit ratio, right? So you're adding time, you're adding risk of complication, uh, and at what cost? And that's the balance that we play. Yes, we could do a lot with the endoscopes. The question is, what's the sweet spot where you're maximizing the value proposition? Uh, so uh, uh, I think it's a scalable procedure, uh, doing an ESD before TORI, uh, bec uh, and I think in the right hands, uh, is quite safe and quite effective, but still unanswered questions and hopefully more data will give us better clarity on the issue. Perfect. So this was the best time to um, wrap up our session and I really appreciate all four of our renowned faculties for giving us some time and education to our audience as well as to uh, Amol and myself. I would hand over to Amol uh, to give the closing remarks and uh, we can wrap up after that. Thank you, Gruptesh, and thanks uh, everyone for shipping in and really having a wonderful interactive session. <clears throat> I take this opportunity to also thank Boston Scientific Corporation, who are who have wholeheartedly supported this educational initiative by an academic grant. 
this this webinar and this webinar series is uh, <clears throat> conducted by <clears throat> the foundation for research and education in, uh, in endoscopy which is a non profit organization which promotes research and education in the field of gi endoscopy and uh, we have several educational initiatives online as well on our portal we would also like to thank all the attendees who joined in today and also for all the questions that were posted by the attendees and that really made the uh, session very interactive. And uh, we also understand that although many attendees do register for the webinar, so many of them cannot join, join in live during uh, due to the time zone differences, but many of them do want to attend the webinar later on at their convenient time. And for this reason, the recording of this webinar will be uploaded on our free endoscopy YouTube channel uh, during the next two to three weeks. And uh, we request you all to subscribe to our channel so that you keep getting all the email updates and notifications. Then regarding the next webinar, and as uh, we all know, we conduct a webinar every three months on a hot topic in endoscopy and interventional endoscopy. So our next webinar will be scheduled sometime in February. It's always a Saturday. So keep your Saturdays free. The time is always 6.30 PM in India. It's, and it's either 8 AM or 9 AM Eastern Standard Time, depending on the you know, daylight saving time. And we will very soon come out with the topic, possibly by end of December, and therefore keep uh, keep the space uh, open and keep look, uh, watching the space for more. And with that, I wish you a wonderful weekend and a good evening to all of your all of my Asian colleagues over here who over here. And thank you once again for joining in. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.